Cooler School is brought to you by Odyssey Games, where you can go to get singles for all your Force of Will and other trading card games, as well as these amazing patrons. Thank you for your support. Enjoy the video. Hey guys, what's going on? It's Paul, and today we're going to be taking a look at GP Charlotte, which happened this past weekend, just a little bit ago in Charlotte, North Carolina. Of course, hit subscribe and the bell down below so you can keep up to date with things like this. And we're going to get right into the ruler breakdown and the deck profiles. So at GP Charlotte, there were about 50 people. 13 of those people were playing Lucifer, 9 were playing Brunhild, 8 were playing Hanzo, 7 were playing Kyrick, 5 were playing Gil, 1 Loki was present, and then the rest were about 17 other rulers. Um, and I don't remember seeing any pandas in that list. And the one thing you're going to notice here is that there are a ton of Lucifer um, decks that were piloted at this event. And the thing that's really important to remember about Lucifer is that it's all about discard. In fact, Lucifer went on to win the whole thing. So this is Sam Sheik's winning Lucifer list. And as you can see, there are some differences based on what he was looking to do in the meta at GP Charlotte. And I am anticipating that if you were to seek him out, he would say that Lucifer is probably the right pick for this GP, mostly because Gil is one of the major rulers that you are going to see. And Lucifer does a lot to sort of mitigate Gil as a J ruler, considering he's running things like Joan of Arc and uh, some other cards that can help deal with uh, Gil as, as a ruler in general. One of the tools that's different for Sam here is going to be March of the Dead. Now March of the Dead is one of those cards that, you know, when you look at it, you're like, this is a decent card, but I don't know where it fits. Um, at least in my case, I'm like, I, I think this is a decent decent card in general. It's a, obviously a Lich support card, but it works in Lucifer as well because you have cards like Contract Demon. So it's a level two Resonator that can come back as a result of March of the Dead. It's also, if you want to awaken March of the Dead, you could bring this back in multiples, draw multiple cards. You're going to be losing some life, but overall it's okay if you're drawing more cards, that's not too bad. And of course, if you have two black runes revealed, it gets plus two, plus two. So it becomes a beater very, very quick. Um, and considering the different runes that we see in Sam's list, uh, one of those is Demon Division, and one of those is also uh, Tears of the Fallen. So you're probably going to be using one of those to set up your future plays, and this is definitely um, something you'll be achieving with Contract Demon very quickly. But of course, March of the Dead can also bring back Ray the Black Owl, which inverts over into zero during your main phase, and that's really nice, all things considered, because then your whole board has this sort of pseudo barrier going for it. And you also have an 8-9 flyer, who is really hard to kill. So that's always really great to bring back so you can start doing things uh, the following turn if your opponent can't get rid of it. And then of course, the Mad Maiden herself, Joan Arc, um, very, very good against Gil considering that she can just put minus minus counters on um, on Gil if she were lucky enough to be able to smack into him. And then suddenly Gil is a 4-4 Jade Ruler that can do things but will die relatively quickly. Um, in general, Joan of Arc is the reason why Gil has so much trouble. If she were able to sort of stick a Joan of Arc on the field, it's really difficult to get her gone, especially if you have multiple creatures on the field. So that's why you're running things like Skeleton Horde. The fact that she is uh, able to gain swiftness and just kind of come in and uh, to deal with Gil pretty nicely is kind of the reason you run her in four. Um, and March of the Dead is just another way for them to just put her back on the field. And if you want to awaken it late game, it's a good way to keep her on the board with multiple resonators. Of course, those aren't the only resonators that you see in the list. Of course, there's the, the, the typical Belial, Majin Dark Elf for some aggression. Astima is also really, really great uh, as a three drop to gain you some life back. But then we have resonators like Grim of the Crimson Moon. Now, this card has not seen a lot of play in general uh, since its release because the meta has always been too fast it was always too focused on Scheherazade um, Rhea as a as a J ruler was not very useful at that period of time and so Grim sort of fell off a little bit and you might have used it in your IMO lists or in another blacklist earlier versions of Lucifer might have used this card but this card has always sort of been around and it's really decent because it has flying barrier white which is really important for stopping 
uh, blade of faith and miscalculation naughty dogs uh, naughty dogs chastising yeah right um, naughty child's chastising and of course it also has barrier black in addition to white so this card is really good and if you happen to have multiple uh, fairy tales in your hand you can reveal them to give him a boost which is you know kind of nice you don't really need it as much um, but the real effect that you want to have um, on your side with this card is that whenever it attacks you put two mystery counters on your J ruler which is a free uh, remnant on your glint of insights very good effect um, it's a really good way of just stacking up those mystery counters Rhea in general just never really had a good way of ramping into a ton of those counters so Grim is definitely a really good way of doing that what's great too is that he's only a three drop so you can uh, especially games two and three you can side into that command of life and death in the in the sideboard and that's really really great so you're gonna say well why are mystery counters so great I mean I understand glint but why else I mean what's really going on here well you have sort of the new moon as a source of removal for your opponent's stuff and you're only running a couple copies but in general this card is really really good at getting rid of pretty much anything level four or below it doesn't get rid of mistletane but it does get rid of things like your opponent's astomas or their ray the black owls or their majin dark elves things like that that might you know in, a, in aggressive situations sort of pose an issue to you um, and this card is really necessary for that and of course if you want to remove a mystery counter from that you actually get that cost for a lower effect which is really nice so in addition to that of course we mentioned glint of insight um, and this card is just really powerful in general and it seems like sam opted to run just two look of corruption and two glint of insight because glint of insight in itself is really just um, look of corruption but you don't have to awaken it with additional will so you can keep your curve relatively low and just cast glint of insight twice for two will and just a couple of mystery counters which is really really great in general this card has always been super powerful probably one of the most powerful cards to come out of winds of the ominous moon the set it came out in and uh, with with mystery counters being relatively easy to come by in this list uh, it's not hard to unlock that remnant effect so um, Grim, Grim of the Grims of Moon is just kind of a really, really good um, just addition to the list in general. He's been sort of in my Lucifer list uh, a little bit earlier in, in the development of my Lucifer list. He was always there because I just thought he was really solid and you could always include some additional fairy tales to pump him up and have him be absolutely ridiculous. And of course, one of the other reasons why I liked him so much in the past is because if you did happen to invert him uh, by flipping your J ruler it just outright destroys whatever J ruler entity you're looking at and it's just a really good way of including J ruler destruction in your deck and then anything that's in your opponent's graveyards especially like if for whatever reason they have flipped their J ruler um, with Grim of the Crimson Moon inverting into Grim hope from the future what's really great about this guy is he turns off your opponent's remnant stuff in the graveyard which is really 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 good so props to grim for the crimson moon it's probably one of the most interesting cards that i saw in the list it's one of the first inclusions that i saw a lot of two ofs um a lot of, sometimes there's some three ofs but generally speaking here we're seeing like two ofs that are really really different um and look of corruption glint of insight things like that but if you start looking into the sideboard you might be confused as to why you're seeing lich now lich is a decent yeah, he's pretty bad. Okay, so let's just be honest. Like, Lich is probably never going to see play as a regular ruler unless he gets some serious support in the next two sets. Or in the future, four sets of the next block. We don't know what those look like yet, though, but he's only a 600-1200. So why is Sam running this in the sideboard? Well, one, his judgment cost is super cheap. It's only black, black, and one. And then on top of that, he also has Bane on his flip side. So your divinity stays the same. Um, you don't get to use Black Rosario, which kind of stinks. Um, using Jet Black Wings would have been a little bit better here, so you got full use of your Divinity, but there's uh, more more talks that we can have around uh, Jet Black Wings a little bit in the future here. Um, but it's really good to have Bane against things like Gil, or especially against things like um, against like Kyrick, where you can sort of slam your Resonators into them, and they all have Death Touch, so they're able to kill everything on your opponent's side of the board. If you have a white board, or Lich can just flip and then threaten Gil 
and uh, Gil will just straight up die to Lich, and Lich won't because of his 1200 defense, which is really, really nice. So you kind of got a sneak peek at Orpheus here, the immortal player. Um, unfortunately, um, from what I understand about Sam, he didn't actually get to play this, and uh, the times that he did, his opponent saw kind of what he was doing. So I would have liked some more information on what he was thinking around this card in particular, but it's a really good way of just sort of removing resonators in your graveyard and gener uh, generating a bunch of support, especially for um, your Joan of Arc, who uh, you really definitely want on the field, and sometimes you can have a difficult time sticking resonators on. Of course, we already talked about Command of Life and Death. Pretty much everything outside of Belial and uh, Blazer, the Legendary Thief, are all uh, three drops or lower. So this card can pretty much grab anything from the graveyard just as like a one of. It's just another March of the Dead. Uh, however, it's just a little bit more uh, clean in how it grabs those resonators. So um, it does definitely does a little bit more reach. And bringing back your Grim or even bringing back your Astima is a pretty decent play, especially late game when you just need to sort of put in the last nail of the coffin. Next we're going to talk about Sword of Lament. Now Sword of Lament is one of those cards that I definitely overhyped when I first started looking at the, the cards from New Valhalla Cluster. And I thought this card was going to be a lot more uh, ubiquitous, I thought it was going to be around a lot more. It definitely hasn't been, so I was curious as to why it was here. And then I started thinking about the meta a little bit. And then I realized you have rulers like Kirik who definitely want to go in for the final blow and you can just kill them for three will. So then they they waste their J activation um, and they just die, essentially. They get all those strength counters and then they just lose. Um, and typically if Kirik is flipping, they're trying to put in uh, the last little bit of damage so that they can just walk away. But there's also J rulers like Shayla kind of running around in the rogue areas of the meta right now. And Shayla is pretty decent as well. Um, a 10-12 body that can make a thunderstorm and has these really good control support cards is definitely nothing to scoff at, um, especially since I, I don't know if you all saw the on the channel that we had like a Shayla off of um, just a Shayla control list that the Teacher's Lounge actually brewed, and it was a fairly decent list, and I think uh, it's a little bit underplayed as to how decent she could be, especially as a rogue deck. And getting away, getting away with just you know killing her off the bat is. Probably a good plan, because um, that uh, that God's Art is actually pretty nasty. And then, of course, we've seen pandas around, too. Um, we didn't see them a lot here. We didn't even see them in the top eight, to be frank. Um, but Tagris and other forms of aggro are around, and sort of Lament can sort of, you know, stop those from going off. You also have your opponent's Lich. So, like, if things start getting really hairy, and your opponent is playing a Lich that, you know... It's trying to sort of equalize out the board and sort of uh, stop you from doing anything. Uh, Lich is a really good resonator to get rid of with sort of Lament. And then of course, uh, Brunhild, who comes out as a 12-12 flyer, and, and then enters and comes and brings in another resonator as well. Uh, it's really good to get rid of her because a 12-12 flyer is actually pretty threatening. So sort of Lament in general is not a bad card by any means. Um, it's pretty decent. But again, what about Jet Black Wings? Um, frankly, I didn't even realize that they couldn't even use Black Rosario because of Lich. So why not play Jet Black Wings? And they were kind of going back and forth about that, I guess, uh, whether or not they wanted to play this card over Black Rosario. Um, but then I started thinking about sort of what was the downside of this card in general. And so I think the reason they just opted to not flip Black Rosario when they had Lich on the field because they couldn't use it was because of cards like, you know, Lancelot. So Lancelot, you know, it's 6-6. Six, six. It should normally die to Jet Black Wings in a vacuum. However, his ability and the fact that he's running, you know, a bunch of other machines around him means that he's probably going to have a plus one, plus one counter at least um, on him, which means that Jet Black Wings is just sort of out of reach. And in general, what we're seeing is a lot of diverse evolution. We're seeing... Uh, just a bunch of ways to get plus one plus one counters on your machine so jet black wings may not be as um, high utility anymore in in terms of how it works but then you have resonators like ray the black owl and piggy who have 700 defense and that's really relevant considering that jet black wings is one of those cards that's like this is really good except when 
I don't actually kill the Resonator. So if they wanted to run Jet Black Wings to get around cards like this, they might have also wanted to play something like Sandstorm to, you know, do that extra 200 damage of reach. But then of course you have a bunch of recursion um, that doesn't necessarily um, stop, you know, because Jet Black Wings creates that cloud effect, so if anything comes back into the field, it gets that minus six, minus six all over again. But if they, like, run into something and they want to deal Jet Black Wings damage to it afterward, you can Power of Immortality it back into the back into the field, as well as March of the Dead on their turn. They just bring it right back anyway. So, is this card as necessary? I don't really know. Um, I kind of go back and forth on it myself. I can kind of see the reason why he didn't run it. But I can also see that you know having Sandstorm in here might have been uh, <laughs> might have been a useful choice as well, especially if they're not citing into Lich for any any particular reason. Um, Black Rosario should typically do the job. So so yeah. Anyway, that's Sam's list. Uh, check it out down below in the description. All the other lists are going to be there as well. Most of the lists I'm going to warn you all are pretty standard. Um, Kirik does Kirik things. They play the tournament now. Nothing really crazy going on there. Gil, in general, still does what he always does. Runs a variation of Arrival to the Hero. Um, is playing Gil, Inheritor to the Stars. You know, things like that. Yeah, it's it's the basic package. Um, most Gil lists are now running a black stone instead of a blue stone. So, keeping all of that in mind, um, everything's been pretty standard. Except for this next list. So next up we have Ryan Miles Loki Machines list, and I and I love that we keep seeing machines in some fashion to sort of crop up every once in a while in these GPs. Uh, machines have been, quite frankly, my favorite archetype to come out of New Valhalla. And what we're seeing is that you don't have to necessarily stick to Arthur. You can also play Hanzo, that Hanzo list from a few videos ago, um, for I think it was GP. Manchester, I believe, <laughs> with Erendites in the sideboard. The list was amazing. Um, it just ran Hanzo and just ran Bluestones, and it was great. And now we're seeing the same variation with Loki. Now, some of you might be looking at Loki and saying, well, "What? what is going on here? She doesn't provide any sort of offense, and it, she's really just like a linchpin. So as you can see here, you may pay two less for the awakening cost of spells you control. And it says spells, so that means resonators and chants. So just keep that in mind. This is for both. Although in this situation, you're going to be using Loki mostly for dinosaur surfacing. So what we haven't seen is we haven't seen this card in a long time since Time Spinning Witch was out of the meta. And what we're seeing with dinosaur surfacing now is three drop Mosasaurus, which seems pretty darn good to me. And we're running it in you know the span of three copies with two Dragon Swords Breath, uh, a couple Mystery Box, and a Keys' Call. And that's perfectly fine uh, for the whole for the whole package. And if you're getting to the point where you're going to be using Mystery Box, it's late game, and that's just your win button, essentially. But this isn't the only uh, variation in this list. You're going to see that this is mostly a diversity list, but it's running just mono blue. And the other card that we've been seeing a lot more of lately has been Rebellious Soul Ayu. And when I first saw this card, I didn't really understand why it was in the list, because I'm like, I mean, it's a 6-6 flyer, so I guess that's why you're running it, and you just need that flying damage. But then I started remembering about Jizo Statue, because Jizo Statue is a one-drop, and if it gets huge, suddenly it's a one-drop that is, you know... A 10 10 or <laughs> it could be huge at some point right and you could just steal this thing with a rebellious soul Ayu, um, which is not only a way of getting rid of blocker but it's also a way of changing the tempo in your favor but then there are other one drops that we have in the game right now that are actually pretty decent to take so one of those is skeleton horde now we're not seeing a borozuki i guess is the way you say it um we're not seeing that current around a lot however um, getting rid of one of these guys is really nice so that way they don't play their tokens, which is really nice. We're also starting to see Fairy of the Lost Isle kind of come out of hiding again. We haven't seen her since last set, last format, where she was used around uh, Chimimi a lot because of Spirit Stone. But we haven't been seeing her a lot at all. But she's a flyer and she can, you know, banish herself to draw a card, which is pretty nice. So Rebellious Soul Ayu is either going to force them to banish the card itself or it's just going to steal it and then you have a 4-4 flyer that you can use the banish effect for yourself. Which is pretty nice if they don't have any open will, it's pretty great. Um, if they're just sort of on the, 
if they're on the draw and they don't want to use their uh, <laughs> they're energized to get rid of this thing to draw a card it's a pretty nice way to force some really interesting plays but of course there's also Lorite. Now you might be saying Lorite is kind of useless if it's already on the field, but then you have seven disciples. So getting rid of Lorite is a really good way of stopping their crazy plays from happening. Seven disciples being one of the best aggressive green cards that we have in the format in general. So these are the major variations that we're seeing when it comes down to the Loki machine list, which is really more like Loki diversity. And it's really great to see that we have Mystery Box alongside that. So we have like just sort of these overlapping deck archetypes and these overlapping deck ideas. One of the other things that people were very confused about were uh, three Camelots in the main board. And I think that's mostly just to go with Mystery Box. If you have a Guinevere on the field and you slam down a Camelot, you're gonna be doing a whole bunch of removal on your opponent's side of the field. So you can run multiples, especially if you're running Mystery Box. And it's just a good way of padding out uh, your end game with a bunch of really hefty resonators. So what else is going on in this list? Well, one of the things I wanted to highlight here is this card, Monsterfy in the rune deck. Now this card is interesting because it's a quick cast for one, and it just turns any of your resonators into a 9-9 until the end of the turn, which is kind of crazy. Um, it's definitely something blue flavored, but one of the things that I really wanted to highlight for you veteran players is how this is basically water transformation magic, but it doesn't turn itself into a bear, and it also doesn't lose its effects. So that's it's kind of the same basic idea, but in reverse. And so, why is this card necessary? Why do you want to run this card in your rune deck? Well, it's only Divinity 2, so that's pretty nice. But then if you have cards like Guinevere, who, let's be honest, will just lose to a Sandstorm flip, this card is really decent especially if you're able to get a whole bunch of plus one plus one counters on it now if it's early game and they're like i just want to get rid of your i just want to get rid of your guinevere you can monsterify it and then it's a nine nine plus it has the plus one plus one counters on it so it gets even bigger that's really great you want guinevere to stick around for a little bit because if you get those 12 counters and you're able to remove them camelot coming in is very good to swing back in temp in terms of tempo but it's also good for Vivian because she puts her own plus one plus one counters on herself and she's a flyer. So if you're able to make her a nine nine with the plus one plus one counters on her, you're basically giving her a six six boost on both stats, which is really, really great. But then you have things like Lancelot who comes in and, you know, buffs the field and sometimes he can just be outright killed if they have the right amount of uh, of, of neg hate on you and <laughs> monsterifying him is actually a pretty decent way of making him survive some effects and stuff like that. In general, I really like Ryan's list. I just in general really like how machines are actually being put on the board and they're not necessarily the best deck, but they're not necessarily a rogue deck either. They're sort of in this weird in-between space where they have the capability of doing some really great stuff, but they're not to the point where they're like, I'm going to outright just win this GP. But if we keep seeing lists like this, uh, whether it be Hanzo or Loki, or even just a straight up Arthur variant, uh, machines seem to be one of those decks that is creeping up. So we're going to have to keep our eyes on that. With that being said, this is the kind of meta shakeup that we're seeing. And the thing that I have to say about this is that these are not like Gil is the best deck. It's it's really more like this is the pentagram that, that Ryan Miles was talking about in his ARG video. So right now, Lucifer and Gil are pretty huge. Kyrick is also, uh, Kyrick and Aggro in general, I'll say. So things like Pandas and um, Freyla potentially as well. These are all decks that have the ability to threaten Gil and threaten Lucifer, especially if Lucifer is going the, the control with Athenia route, um, where it's a little bit slower. So Kyrick has a way of sort of tearing into the meta, especially if, it, if it's against something like uh, Hanzo or Brunhild, it might have some it might have a tougher time kind of squeaking through because of all the removal and because of all the crazy battle tricks that the, those decks can do. But in general, Kyrick is always going to be a threat. It's the best red ruler that we've got. So there's going to be a ton of support that is uh, sort of formed around him and Scarlet from last cluster, but mostly for him. And what we're seeing with Hanzo is that he can go in multiple different directions. Uh, he can go into a diversity Hanzo where he's running the machines as well as uh, diversify, but also running some 
you know, some green stuff. He's also able to just run a straight quick cast variant. We've even seen lists where he just runs, you know, black stones and just goes all in on the look of corruption package and just, you know, plays Lucifer but it has Hanzo instead. And then Brunhild does something similar as well. She has the mono white variant with Orphica and Air as a combo internally. Uh, Messenger of the Sun is always going to be really good with her, especially since you have Blade of Faith, which, you know, you can remove something on your opponent's side of the field and draw a card per Messenger of the Sun. So you have multiples on the field. That's really great. She's also a really good way of swinging tempo back into your favor as a 12-12 flyer that enters and brings something back. She's always going to be good. And, I mean, unless Blade of Faith suddenly becomes terrible, <laughs> I don't really know why. Uh, but Brunhild is a really good way of getting around Joan of Arc, which is what Lucifer is running now. So we might see a resurgence of, Bl of Brunhild going forward into the meta, especially if Gil's, you know, Gil players tend to taper off in favor of Brunhild. But it was definitely evident that players going into GP Charlotte were expecting Gil to be probably the number one deck. Even if a very few amount of players actually showed up, Gil had the potential to just outright win the whole thing. And frankly, Aaron Miles made it to top two, so probably that call was right. Who knows how that matchup would have gone, but my thought is that Lucifer would have had a, a much more easy time dealing with Gil, considering he has Joan of Arc and Look of Corruption, Glint of Insight, all of these really strong cards that help pick away all of the things Gil needs to be a good control deck. In general, though, I just want to pass off the question to you. What ruler are you going to play casually? Now, you're going to say, Paul, I know we were just talking tournaments. Why are we talking casuals and locals and stuff like that? The way I look at it is, we all just sort of need a breath of fresh air, and right now I'm playing Chimimi Mimi Tribe with no Disciples and uh, no Beast Engine at all, all based on a dare, and I'm having a huge, uh, huge time having just a, a ton of fun with the deck. It's absolutely awesome to play, especially since most of the Mimi Tribe cards, I've never been like, you know, I want to play that. So I'm playing that, and I just brewed a an aggro Isis list without the sand people <laughs> in it, so <laughs> I'm interested in that as well. Um, but there's tons of other rulers that I like too that I just like to play casually. And uh, I'm just filling out my collection for Wanderer as well, so this was just on my mind. Like competitive competitive uh, Force of Will is really great, but casual Force of Will is just as fun. That's the great thing about this game. So let me know, what ruler are you playing casually on your kitchen tables, at your locals, with your friends, whatever. Let us know down in the comment section down below. What did you think of these lists? What did you think of this event? That's also something you put down there too. And while you're down there, hit the like button or hit the dislike button if you didn't like the video and let us know why. Hit subscribe and ring the bell so you have more content like this. We have the Teacher's Lounge every every Monday night at 9 p.m. EST. So that's a great way of touching base with Jeremy Franklin, Ryan Miles, Frank Klosser, and Brandon Bremont talking about the competitive nature of the game. Especially if you're new, I really would recommend that. We also have feature matches on Wednesday, and then we have the deck profiles for the decks used in the feature matches all throughout the weekend. So it's a really good reason to hit subscribe and ring the bell, so that way you're notified of all the different stuff that we're doing here at Ruler School. But my name has been Paul. I will see you for the next GP tournament report, which I believe is GP Paris. Anyway, guys, I'll catch you later. Bye.